on. I think we're going to broadcast and start. We are. I'm going to start the music. We're going to. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll start. Uh, <laughs> so we wanna welcome everyone for being here today. For our attendees who've signed in, thank you for taking the time to log on. And we're very happy to have four excellent panelists with us today to dis discuss mobility as a service. SIBC is hosting a webinar every week called SIBC Connects, where we lift up pertinent questions in the Sweden-India corridor. We are very, very lucky to have two days this week that discuss mobility. We had our first webinar yesterday with some utilities discussing some of the issues when it comes to energy demand and electric ambition internationally, globally, and of course, with India and Sweden. Today, we have four panelists that are looking at mobility as a service to take us forward in the discussion. We have a co-moderator, Albin Karlen, from the Swedish Energy Agency, Albin and SIBC and myself have been working together for three years on the mobility discussions between India and Sweden. Before I hand over Albin, I want to put down some hygiene rules for the attendees and panelists. We are recording, so anyone who wants a copy of the recording can get in touch with us and we will send it to you. We also have a Q&A panel at the bottom of the window, and we ask our attendees, please, as we go along the panel discussion, to put down your questions, who you are, and if there is someone on the panel that it's directed to, to let us know. At the end of our panel discussion today, we will lift up the Q&A questions from the audience. We did not get a chance yesterday to do that, and we are committed today to making sure the audience and that their value is made felt in our discussions today. With that, I hand over to Alvin to take us forward. Thanks, Arti. Uh, I, my name is Alvin Kalena, as stated. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I represent the Swedish government and the Swedish Energy Agency. And I'm here to let you know that we are here to support and continue to support the, the discussion between uh, India and Sweden in the mobility and smart grid space. Uh, we have been working with promoting collaboration between our two countries um, in the energy space with in close partnership with the uh, CAI and SIBC and many other Swedish and in Indian organizations. Um, so we want to see more Indian and Swedish companies doing business and collaborating together. Um, we have a long track record of trying to promote that and evidently so it has given results. Um, for the smaller companies uh, we have a program called India Sweden Innovation Accelerator and it continues to offer a way in for, for Swedish companies and SMEs who would like to connect with Indian counterparts. Um, and that leads to business and mobility, of course, is one area that we are keenly supporting. Um, and there are more opportunities coming. Uh, now there is, we are lining up a call together with uh, DST, Department of Science and Technology in India, um, encompassing 5 million euros. And it's set to open in a couple of weeks. So these uh, seminars and calls, they're also a way for us to connect with you out there and make sure that we get really, really good applications when the call opens. So stay tuned for more information on, on that as we progress during this webinar. Um, and you are, of course, very, very welcome to ask questions to us during this webinar, but also connect with us afterwards and we'll let you know more information about that. Great, so I'll start the questions. And what we'd like to do today is, is try and divide the forecasting and, and answers from the panelists between what's happening now and what you see happening in the future in a post-COVID economy and a post-COVID world. So if we start with what's happening now in the various fields that you're working in and the, the roles that you take in the electromobility shared, ecosystem, shared mobility uh, ecosystem, what is happening on the ground in terms of your business model, in terms of your football, in terms of the reactions and impact that COVID has had on you. We start, of course, with Anil, or with Clean Motion. Anil, you're on the front line, really. Since right. the 24th, India has been under lockdown. And so there has yeah. been zero footfall. Um, yeah. And Anil, of course, is the CEO of Clean Motion India. 
one of the country's first electric three-wheeler uh, pilots and commercial vehicle outlays. You've been running uh, the Cyber Hub route, so everyone in Delhi would know you very well and would know yes. Clean Motion very well. What's been happening now? What's uh, Clean Motion, um, what's the impact since March 24th for you? Yeah, so basically, um, you know, our business is completely offline. So we have to depend on uh, real customers or what we call real commuters, and they currently have vanished. Uh, so neither are people going to office and uh, neither are people visiting malls. Um, so we've had to shut down along with the malls because, you know, all the commercial hubs like Cyber Hub and Cyber City, uh, people who've come to Delhi would be familiar. Um, so there's about 600,000 people who work in Cyber City. And then we work with very high footfall malls. Uh, so these operations are shut, but you know they will open sooner or later. Uh, so, um, but uh, uh, currently, uh, you know, we we are brainstorming and re reevaluating what uh, the post-COVID world would look like in terms of first and last mile connectivity, right? Uh, so we we see some things where we see challenges, and we see some areas where we see opportunities. Uh, especially opportunities in first and last mile, uh, in the sense that uh, you know we've uh, always maintained a very hygienic service with them. We have drivers on our payrolls, right? So we actually pay the drivers, and we have a large amount of control over them. And even towards the end, when you know things were shutting down, we had maintained certain SOPs. So my drivers have been wearing masks <clears throat> since the first week of March. <clears throat> and uh, using hand sanitizers and so we don't do right share so you need to book the entire vehicle because my vehicle only carries two people um, you know so we don't see such a challenge going forward uh, you know provided we maintain a <clears throat> clean hygienic service and um, you know we get a lot of support from our formats and I was in discussion with DLF recently and they're putting in these chambers um, you know, the sanitizing chambers where they will run people and um, vehicles through before they get them to park. So, you know, we see that uh, maybe the footfalls will fall, but uh, we, we don't see that they sh it should really impact our business hugely, uh, you know, compared to the people, uh, you know, the, the vehicles which are available on the streets. The other thing we see is that um, an app will become important is because we'll have to scout more customers and a vehicle on demand so you know uh, get the vehicle to where the person is living uh, we did this with a call center but uh, we actually have been talking to another swedish company which is carrying on uh, a pilot with around 50 or 60 zvs in stockholm and um, we're trying to get them to india and integrate their app uh, into our service which should happen seamlessly that should take a month or two so we plan to do that while we are shut down. And uh, the other thing I think which we had discussed is uh, the big opportunity now, especially now for artificial intelligence, because um, uh, you know, contact, uh, contactless uh, mobility would, uh, I think, play a big role going forward. I mean, and it's uh, the right time to uh, establish proof of concept and get the government working on it because the government will obviously be looking at more, um, be more open to new ideas, you know, uh, where, you know, mobility does not create, uh, you know, more victims, but uh, gives the commuter a high level of confidence that he's commuting in a clean, safe and reliable vehicle. Um, so I, I think going forward, we would probably be looking at this as a service for short commutes. Thanks very much, Anil. Your message is, uh, sounds very hopeful, uh, although you have a difficult situation right now. We will dive in more into the future in a little bit, but before we do that, I would like to hand over to our next speaker, Ms. Charlotte Eisner, and you are the tribe leader at NEVS, and a really established name in, in Sweden when it comes to the electrification of the automotive sector. And NEVS is uh, former Saab Automotive, and it's uh, the technology forerunner within Evergrande, a developer of mobility ecosystems and 
smart cities. And now on your agenda, we'll find stuff like launch of P2P car sharing services, self-driving vehicles and connected electric cars. So you're really in the, in the future business. So I would like to see, I would like to ask you as well. I mean, if we focus on the right now, what can you yeah. tell us about your current operations? Yes. Um, being an automotive uh, supplier and provider of cars, uh, it's very fascinating to also now be owned by a property developer, like you mentioned, uh, because this gives us um, uh, a lot of areas where we can develop services suited for the world we're in right now with uh, the COVID-19 disease and everything. I would say the key, the key words that we are working around our access and that is giving uh, people access to mobility even though they might not want to own their own car also providing access for vehicles to enter into um, uh, properties and garages that are locked for public use uh, thus creating a sharing platform uh, for vehicles and, and uh, mobility services so access to space and also access to vehicles is uh, the business we're in. And uh, uh, the um, um, car sharing service that we are launching is uh, based on the fact that we're using cars that already exist. So we are not uh, in this um, time adding vehicles to the cities, but using the vehicles that are already there owned by either companies or uh, car dealerships or privately owned cars uh, and what we have is a, a digital box where we could manage uh, to lock and unlock the car uh, from an application uh, a handheld phone application uh, so uh, looking at the the corona situation now um, it has really been working with us uh, in launching this service because less and less people want to commute to, through train or underground or bus at the moment. Uh, but of course, still we do need to, to travel and we need to travel safely. Uh, we are asked not to meet people. Uh, so the keyless solution that we provide uh, is a good one. Uh, and uh, of course, most of us know that vehicles even before the crisis, most vehicles are standing still between 95 and 97 percent of the time. Uh, and uh, the take we have at this moment is to utilize the, the vehicles that we have more, up to 60 percent, so that we could uh, retire them and, and uh, sort of recycle them faster and, and then have more energy smart vehicles on the street, electric ones or, or um, fuel cell ones. So um, in the cars, we supply uh, the, the cleaning material to uh, um, uh, address the, the Harvard study that I guess most of us read that uh, COVID-19 virus might stay for as long as 72 hours on plastic, vinyl and, and metal surfaces. Uh, and if we want to have an efficient use of uh, sharing cars, this is something we need to address. Um, but we're also looking to help in, in the, 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 would say, close society. So we're creating mobility clubs. Either you could start a mobility club where you live in an apartment building or a rented house or in a close neighborhood. Uh, so um, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer idea is not to have free-floating cars, but where you pick it up, you should also return it uh, safely. Uh, and uh, this is um, our contribution to a system where before probably you could um, consider helping a neighbor with a car if, if uh, the neighbor asked you, but then you would feel a little bit unsure if, if anything would happen to the car, damage or, or car crash or anything. Um, how would you solve that? It would be difficult to solve it with um, mending the car, but also the relationship to the neighbor could need mending. Uh, so. Having um, uh, a serious and good um, solution with insurances and, and a fully, let's um, say, 100% good insurance to go with this car service is something that we're also working with. And for NEVS, this is um, 
an important part of, of uh, starting to change a behavior. We would like to know more about uh, what makes a person who affords to own a car, can have a car, affords to have it standing still, what can trigger that person to open up and allow for the car to help others? And uh, today, of course, people need to go shopping. We make jokes about it a lot in Sweden that uh, the amount of toilet paper we've been buying lately is, uh, is uh, enormous. And, and to find it, you need to travel far. <laughs> so it's not within walking distance. Uh, but a more serious thing is really to protect the elderly and, and the already ill people to allow them to travel safe, even those who do, don't own their own car. So thanks, the uh, thanks, thanks, Charlotte. Uh, we, I'm going to stop you right there and, and enable you to to go back more more into to future issues later. But our, our, I will introduce the next panelist, and and that's Mr. Uh, Bascar Dio. He's the CEO of eDrive, and uh, Bascar, you you are co-founder also of, of eDrive, and it's an Amsterdam-based uh, software startup focusing on connected electric vehicle charging infrastructure and after spending several years in India you, you moved to Europe in 2018 and you live in Amsterdam but you are also developing solutions now for for the Indian uh, market um, That's right. with with pilots uh, that we will talk about also later in the, in this seminar um, so so turning to you uh, Baskar, Baskar what's what's happening for you right now Sure. Uh, thanks, Albin. Uh, thanks, Arti, for setting it up. Uh, so, hi, everyone. I'm Baskar. Uh, just to tell you a little bit very briefly about eDrive, we're a software uh, startup uh, working on uh, making it easy to integrate charging management uh, in, in all sorts of uh, ways, uh, bringing them to uh, business customers and, uh, and also some networks. So in India specifically, we're working with the Energy Efficiency Services Limited. Um, I'll, uh, in your what next question, Albin, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, some of the projects that we are kind of just embarking on. Uh, but maybe if I can uh, talk more about what does COVID mean for us right now. So as a, uh, you know, as, as a mobility venture, uh, you know, what we're kind of seeing is there is um, a little bit of a freeze, but um, I'm quite uh, pleased to see that both charging infrastructure and electric vehicle purchase remains, or in fact, might even be coming out on top as a, a priority, both for you know, uh, public, uh, public policymakers who are choosing to um, sort of support the infrastructure stimulus uh, going behind clean infrastructure. Uh, rather than you know the old uh, old uh, old way, and uh, specifically what that means is also uh, you know consumers are kind of for the first time seeing, and I think this kind of came up in the webinar yesterday, where somebody mentioned for the first time uh, you know you could see mountains from you know cities, and then it's just that we uh, did not have the opportunity to experience clean air in Delhi quite the way that this crisis is showing us, and I think uh, I do believe a lot of people are asking themselves the question you know, well, this could, this could be a reality and we could have clean air like this. And, you know, as someone who lived in Delhi for seven years and uh, annually ran the uh, half marathons during the times when the air quality was the worst, uh, I would really like to see um, that happen. And, and, and it's not just me, you know, it's a lot of consumers and this is not research just in India. Recently, I've come across publications across the globe where more and more people are saying that this experience is kind of motivating buyers or even first time buyers who are considering buying EVs to look at uh, this, this purchase. I wanna say a couple of things. Um, uh, the infrastructure boost will definitely work to the advantage um, of uh, electric vehicle charging, which uh, we all know is one of, you know, it's kind of often uh, raised as one of the key barriers uh, to EV adoption. So uh, I think that will really help uh, take us a long way, uh, both in India and also elsewhere. Um, the other thing, and uh, I know uh, Anil talked about it a little bit, and we're going to hear from Shilpi in a minute. Uh, it's quite clear that fleets are the uh, most uh, attractive uh, segment today for electric vehicles, whether it's two-wheelers, three-wheelers, or even uh, taxi fleets. Um, I, I believe that will remain so. Um, I think we're going to see a little bit of a, a blip where, you know, people are concerned about their, their health because of, you know, we, we're just going to have to uh, move to a higher level of hygiene and, you know, just taking care of, uh, you know, 
of, of, of how clean every all the services are, particularly around uh, shared mobility. But I think once we get around that, we're going to see the long-term trend of uh, moving away from private ownership and towards shared ownership, like uh, Charlotte, you talked about, uh, kind of continue. And uh, so we're very excited to be a part of that. Basket, thanks so much. And thank you for joining us yesterday as well. Just for the audience members that are with us who was not, were not here yesterday, what came out from that discussion, and we had some interesting panelists there, was that there has been a very high drop in energy demand in India. And that's putting pressure on EV as a concept. But charging infrastructure and proof of concept will become critical components of driving electric forward. And I think that is a great introduction for Shilpi from Ola Mobility Institute. Now, OMI is supported by Ola Cabs, but is also an independent think tank. And o OMI came, um, came to fame, you could say, last year when it released one of the first large scale proof of concept uh, rollouts in Nagpur with electric vehicles. But what was interesting with that report is you went from four wheeler, two wheeler, three wheeler, and took care of the whole ecosystem. And coming back to what Anul said earlier, you also put in and took the risk of financial responsibility for all the workers in the ecosystem to create a behavioral change based on trust. Now, OMI has been doing a lot of reports in the last um, few months during COVID about the impact it's having on the ground. And she'll be responsible for climate change and the electric mission. It'd be great to hear from you and OMI what's happening on the ground in India during this time. Uh, thank you, Aarti. Hi, I'm Shilpi. Um, so with the current pandemic, I see transport and the mobility sector to be one of the most affected sectors in the current, in the current situation. Uh, coming from a ride hailing company, we see that travel demand has fallen by 80 to 90 percent in the cities, not only in, in India, but throughout the world. Uh, remote working, virtual events, distant education, telehealth, these are now becoming the new normal. And these changing mobility dynamics is going to have some long lasting impact on the society, even in the post COVID world. So uh, social partnerships are laying foundation for the post COVID world. The private sector is, is playing a contributive role in the society by responding quickly to the themes of safety and access while securing safety for the consumers and workers, mobility organizations such as ride hailing companies, vehicle rentals, uh, delivery services are coming together to facilitate access to essential services such as food, groceries, medicines, uh, transportation, and uh, they're also supporting unsheltered and uh, vulnerable populations. So uh, mobility services are leveraging technology and their agile workforce to ensure safety. Uh, these days, public transit services are more focused on digital uh, ticketing and payments, uh, digital tracking of passenger occupancy to enable physical distancing, uh, frequent disinfecting of all surfaces. Um, similarly, ride hail and mobility platforms are providing protective barriers between the seats of the drivers and passengers. They are providing hand sanitizer, masks, and are educating their driver partners and consumers um, on safety and hygiene standards. Um, at Ola also, we have introduced a new mobility category called Ola Emergency uh, in over 15 cities in India. And through Ola Emergency, Ola is providing convenient, reliable, and safe transport services at a very nominal fee for all the non-COVID related uh, medical trips and is working with various uh, authorities to help and support the healthcare uh, workers uh, for the commute purpose. Um, yeah, and, and we'll talk more around this as we move on with the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Shilpi. We'll, we'll uh, dive more into what you are doing in a while and, and the new, new scenarios in the post-COVID world. Um, but now turning to, uh, to um, again to, to our panelists for, for our second question here. We are, we are going to start looking ahead a little bit more. I mean, you are already living in the future, uh, but um, do you think that anything, anything will change in the post-COVID world where, where, for example, trust we know will be a very important factor going forward? Um, so, so I would like to, to turn to you, Charlotte. I mean, you, you, you have lifted behavior very strongly, for example. And you have also highlighted the different tools that you have in your toolbox. How do you how how do you intend to to move ahead in this new world? 
Yeah, the the future scope of NEVS is to create an ecosystem with seamless solutions, everything from micro mobility, the last mile solution that Anil was uh, mentioning, uh, and uh, to uh, uh, provide routing and optimization of mobility. And, and of course, this will be one part of solving, not having people standing still in one place waiting for a bus or waiting for the underground to, to come. Uh, but instead, we would like to uh, add uh, self-driving vehicles um, to the cities and, and route them. And as we heard from Baskar and then Shilpi and all, all of the panel, uh, we see this as the future that we could customize uh, mobility and not only for for people but also for goods and also combining moving goods and people and and to that also adding uh, solving the the grid uh, problem that we might have with with power uh, enough power for the electric vehicles so uh, in only uh, two to three years time we will present to the market self-driving vehicles that in the morning, uh, before and after work hours, they will commute and very efficiently free floating and also route-based um, bring people to and from work. And for the rest of the hours, these vehicles will either be uh, transporting uh, elderly or sick people with two sick beds, like uh, complementing the, the healthcare with transports, safe transports, and also, um, uh, providing mobile conference rooms uh, as a complement to this, where we are all digital. That could be a combination of digital, like screen and mobile um, conferences happening in our vehicles and so on and so forth. And these vehicles, of course, will also be mobile energy storages that could um, be called to, say, a hospital uh, or um, another industry building where they have um, a short time lack of power and we could everything it's a, it's a free market if it's uh, more efficient to use the the vehicles as uh, a mobile energy storage for a few hours during the day that will happen uh, so so to have uh, this uh, I would say 360 picture of what the city needs to, to solve is what we're trying to do but of course this uh, again, uh, this um, asks for an openness. Uh, we need to share the resources that we have and we need to provide access to uh, vehicles owned by me or somebody else, uh, access to garages, access to buildings. Uh, and um, uh, this takes time. Um, and it also needs a lot of trust between uh, people you don't know and the people who own, uh, say, a building or a garage where you want to, to have access. So um, the, the technical solutions are always the, the easiest ones to solve. Um, uh, and I would say that we have them and together with companies like the one Baskar is representing, uh, working with open APIs, uh, finding easy to use um, applications. Um, a lot of companies are already forefront when it comes to that technology, but um, uh, in ensuring that politicians and decision makers are supporting us and that we have a legal system and also a tax legislation that is supporting us, uh, that takes a little bit more time. Because right now we're not really where Airbnb is with uh, rental of houses. That's easy and you could rent a lot without getting taxed uh, from the first Swedish crown. Um, but when it comes to lending your car like this, um, we don't have that um, attractive system today, but hopefully after the summer. So everything can happen very fast. Sounds like you have some lobbying to do as well. Also, yes, <laughs> it's part of it. <laughs> Thanks, Charlotte, very clear. I would like to turn over to Vaskar and uh, eDrive for, for, and I would, Actually, I ask you as well if you if you um, if you can uh, to to comment a little bit more on on the grid connection and and how to enable that. Thanks for uh, thanks for the call, Alvin. Uh, so okay, uh, the grid connection enabling. Sorry, just a question. Uh, when you mean enable, do you mean uh, access at all, or yeah, exactly. do you mean... So access and smooth operations of distribution grids? 
Sure. So let me let me answer it in a slightly uh, indirect manner. I would say um, globally. I mean, this is not just a problem for India, right? Um, the uh, EVs represent a huge potential energy demand, and and I think it's not just a problem for Delhi. It's probably uh, an issue for any any regular office building where you know when you get to any reasonable penetration of electric vehicles then you need to manage the demand uh, in, in a manner that doesn't blow the fuse or you know blow through your contract demand limits set by the utilities so, so uh, I, I do think that going forward um, and maybe this is a problem that India needs to solve much sooner than many other countries will have to um, uh, scheduling smart charging will become almost uh, the first major issue that uh, folks working in the electric vehicle charging industry will have to kind of get around. And uh, just to kind of tell you a little bit uh, more about how uh, we are kind of working on it, we're currently working on uh, sort of the most recent protocols for charging management and, and they provide provisions for smart charging, but then uh, also security, being able to connect uh, just to plug in charge, which is, you know, your vehicle is automatically recognized by the charging station. And so kind of like the scenarios that Charlotte uh, kind of outlined uh, in, in, in autonomous vehicles, which will kind of lead up to those. Uh, we are uh, also working on sort of making this uh, more widely accessible to the customers that we kind of uh, having discussions with. The other uh, interesting aspect for the transition towards um, EVs will also come around just roaming or across networks. So, you know, imagine a scenario even two years from now, or I mean, you could have this problem today. If you were to drive from Delhi all the way to Gujarat, uh, that you'll be passing many, many networks. Some of it may be ESL, some of them may be by Fortum or another private or public sector provider. So what will be the standards for interoperability between charging networks? Now, this is a problem that uh, has pretty much not been solved uh, anywhere. I think Europe uh, kind of took a pretty messy approach uh, to addressing it. I think there's a lot of lessons in there. Uh, in fact, we're just kickstarting a collaboration with the uh, New Delhi-based uh, Council on Energy, Environment and Water, where specifically we're putting together an advisory group from uh, a combining of European as well as Indian experts, from utilities, from uh, charging hardware manufacturers, from OEMs, from network uh, providers. Um, to, to specifically address what should this, what should be the approach for India to make EV charging accessible for, uh, you know, for, for consumers, because ultimately then this also becomes a barrier <clears throat> that must be uh, overcome for charging. Very clear. Thank you. And, and what, what, what's, hap what's happening next in your operations? Yeah, so we're kickstarting the collaboration with uh, CW, as I just mentioned, uh, that should be, <clears throat> in fact, we would have had a physical event in June, uh, which we had to postpone as uh, many events have been postponed. So that would have been sort of the, uh, the original point for that. So uh, I'd welcome and invite all participants uh, to kind of, you know, keep an eye out for uh, announcements around that. Uh, specifically for us, uh, we have been able to use this time uh, to hunker down and do a lot of the product development. We're finding that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the product managers uh, of uh, hardware suppliers who would be very difficult to get in touch with, you know, we've been able to use the opportunity of the downtime and the fact that they're sitting at home to, to, to really get access to them. And uh, so we're uh, using the opportunity presented by the crisis to uh, do more of the development. Uh, we're also actually finding that our business development efforts are not uh, affected as much as uh, one would have imagined because we cannot travel. So, uh, so yeah, this is, uh, you know, this is, there's, there's always sort of a silver lining. So we're trying to make the most of that. Thanks. Thanks, Bhaskar. I'm going to let Charlotte in very briefly, just uh, 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. When we were mentioning the charting solution, I just uh, remember that I forgot to say that one of the important things to count in now is that we need to work with DC uh, charging more than AC. The DC current is really what the uh, the batteries uh, uh, are charged with, also what are, is generated from uh, the solar cells and what is stored in the energy storage. And uh, um, more and more the property owners uh, learn about this, but uh, still too much is about AC charging still, and that is uh, not going to solve it uh, going forward. So, just wanted to say that. I'm actually going to say thank you. 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to jump in because I think one of the things that's being raised here is a lot of questions about what can happen, what could happen, and what's being worked on. One thing that the Energy Agency, the Smart Grid Forum, and SIBC have been doing a lot of work with the last three years is discussing the value of proof of concept that we touched upon earlier and pilots. When you look at making big changes, who goes first? Who, who actually pays for that change? And how do you create that shift? We, put a, we released a report in December at um, the CEO Roundtable between India and Sweden where we raised some of these questions. And we did this after about 60 different interviews with different people and uh, across the supply chain of, of actors uh, in the electric mobility space in India and in Sweden. And we felt we could have also called the report, which we called opportunities between the two countries, chicken and egg, because we were told every time we spoke to any investor, to any vehicle manufacturer, to any utility, who goes first, who takes the responsibility and who will pay for the pilot. Now we all deal with this in different ways. And of course, OMI as well has taken some big steps in creating large scale pilots. And Varska, you talk about the work you're doing with EESL and I'm also taking big steps in Delhi. Charlotte, you mentioned in our pre-panel the work you're doing in Gothenburg. I'm actually not going to structure it so that I point to one person. Anyone who wants to go first, just raise your hand and speak. But how do you roll out behavioral change and electric ambition in today's economy? So anyone who wants to speak to that, just go for it. I'm going to, I'm actually going to come to Charlotte. <laughs> Start, yeah. Uh, the, uh, the experience that we have is uh, that uh, using the so-called firework theory model is uh, a good way of, of uh, working with pilots. And the firework theory says that you need to just focus on checking your sort of uh, the box of fireworks in a very attractive way. So you know that you have good things. Uh, and uh, and good enough things, I would say, and then just shoot them off uh, using uh, digital communication, social media, uh, and find your um, um, early adopters and your pioneers because they are out there, and it's much more efficient building pilots around uh, enthusiastic, willing people uh, than trying to logically see that this market could be the best market for us and then work it work it to make it happen so with the firework theory of course it's obvious that some of the fireworks they will just sort of uh, fail <laughs> nothing happens but then you didn't invest too much in it and at least you created a little awareness but in some cases it might just be a beautiful sparkle and it sort of lits the other ah, you, you see the picture um, and, and I think actually looking into a, a, a different business Spotify did uh, was really inspiring back then. They they had the longest ever beta version test period for their services, Spotify, doing this disruptive change to the music industry that we want to do within automotive and mobility. And uh, uh, that is sort of what we're doing now at NEMS. We, uh, we, we are offering as an attractive uh, commercial pilot as we can. We know that we have the basic legal stuff is there, the, the basic and needed the technology is there, so it's safe. Uh, we have the insurance and we, ha we have the, the basic sort of uh, necessary things in place. Uh, it's good enough, but for the rest, we're uh, working together with our audience, with the, the uh, pioneers and the customers uh, creating a word of mouth and getting a lot of it, it takes a lot of footwork from us as a company because we need to be in dialogue all the time with, uh, with the early adopters um, and of course uh, sometimes 90% of our the things we do go wrong but uh, uh, also sometimes 90% of the things we do go right and then uh, we learn and learn and uh, and this audience is, is gradually um, growing so this way uh, it's cost efficient uh, and we are actually earning money and we get the response from customer actually paying for the services that they are trying and also helping us develop and with Spotify uh, they uh, they actually raised the price for the monthly fee you pay to get access to they, they charge a lot more than they thought they would be able to charge because people were saying I want to join the beta yes. exactly. I'm prepared to pay I prefer to pay this. 
I mean, I think what you say in terms of word of mouth as part of a proof of concept being successful becomes critical. Just as an aside, what we're trying to do with SIBC and BC Connects is actually create that community who can actually take all the discussions. We have the webinars, 45 minutes, but we want to actually create community of like-minded peer-to-peer uh, partners. And I actually want to, with that, with that concept of word of mouth being a business model, I want to actually ask Anul, because that's exactly the kind of model that you're using. It's advertising is happening on the vehicles, but it's also a word of mouth elite service being provided to customers. And what, how, what has been your experience here? And the pilot that you're running at you in battery swapping, how does that yes. shift the behavioral change? Yes, it's, I, I agree with uh, Charlotte is that uh, you have to, if you do a pilot, you have to get your hands dirty, right? Uh, pilots don't happen on Excel sheets and PowerPoint presentations. So um, we kind of just kind of jumped into it, um, probably with a lot of uh, pressure from our investors that, you know, you've got to show some results and cash flows. Otherwise, uh, the fantastic thing about startups is that you keep talking and building presentations and numbers. Um, so we got into it actually, to be very honest, very reluctantly, and I'll be very honest with you. But it, it was an exhilarating experience because, um, you know, we, in India, we have all these barriers that the vehicle is too expensive. And, uh, you know, you have a key rickshaw which sells for $1,000 and you have a $10,000 vehicle. How is it going to work? And um, so fortunately, I had experience with electric vehicles and I headed a British company earlier. So I, I was confident that something is going to happen, whether it's going to be successful or fail. I mean, that was up in the air. But then we started with just 10 vehicles. And it was, it was a struggle because initially, you know, um, there, you need a lot of funding to create awareness. Uh, you know, you need to go out there, uh, build a market and get people to know. Um, but what, since we just did it with 10 vehicles and we started building community and um, we tried, like Charlotte was saying, we tried certain very unsuccessful um, operations of you know, getting the drivers up at seven in the morning to go to the mayor and pick up commuters, which didn't happen. Uh, and then we found our niche, the timings and, you know, when we have our footfalls and it was really pretty much done very offline, right? Uh, we, but then we, we learned that uh, data driven businesses are far more successful than just, you know, shooting in the dark. And then we started uh, collecting a lot of data from our commuters uh, in terms of, we started getting uh, digital RFID cards, where they could actually, you know, we started building community membership where people actually took these cards because they were daily commuters and they needed the vehicle in the morning, they needed the vehicle in the evening. And uh, in fact, we did a small pilot with Ola on uh, a commuter profile. And uh, we actually understood the 70% of, it was very amazing. I mean, when we actually correlated the data, the 70% of our commuters were women, you know. And at one point of time, I had the Swedish ambassador telling me you should get women drivers. And uh, we were very unsuccessful. We just couldn't find legal, legitimate women drivers with driving license and commercial licenses. But um, around like four years now, and um, we've, we've fairly much understood where we could operate our services and what kind of an ecosystem we can build. And it's basically connecting the dots so you have a hub and spoke model and you do say a radius of five kilometers and you geofence it so you know your your data and your environment is very close so you have very close communication with your commuters and then you start moving out to different hubs and building these battery swaps so you can actually move your vehicle from one hub to another hub and then to another hub and over a period of time you can have an intra-city operation where you have 200 hubs in Delhi and each one of them is connected. And, uh, you know, like Charlotte says, you need real estate. That is, um, is key to this business is you need to have good real estate and trustworthy real estate partners where you can park and charge, put your battery swaps and uh, create this environment where you're actually offering a very premium service. But at a little higher cost than what you would have to do when you're hailing an auto rickshaw on the road. Um, so that's, that's where we are. And um, I think post the COVID, if we can uh, you know, leverage our manufacturing and build vehicles, we would prefer not to sell the vehicles, 
but to operate it themselves because in manufacturing the the margins are very small you'd make 10% and you know your vehicle is sold but when you actually operate the vehicles we've understood uh, is that you make money month to month to month so you know your your your, your tco is uh, is driven by profitability on a month to month basis um, so we can delve into that at some other time but it's it's uh, mobility as a service we found is a is a very profitable business in india actually that brings me actually to baska to give us your point of view and you've got charlotte and anu who are a little bit more veterans in our discussion today you are in our panel today the startup of the of the discussion looking at a european indian corridor what would you say we have to keep in mind for the other startups we might have in the audience today and the ai startups especially when you're looking at a european indian corridor in this area yeah um, and how important are pilots sorry well yeah i think i think pilots are <clears throat> and i think i think uh, uh, i think and you nailed it on the head in terms of pilots are extremely important i think you have to take a data driven approach i think it's more and more i mean it's not even a uh, an option anymore i i would say I, I think you're you're practically flying blind if you're not doing that um in terms of the startups uh, I, I i do think that india already has a pretty rich ecosystem of uh, you know a lot of good innovation that's happening i think uh, i mean all is here bounce i think probably should be here we've heard about blue smart so there's a lot of companies taking very innovative approaches to electrification and and literally electric vehicles being sort of the uh the you know core underlying strategy of how they kind of you know are coming at a particular segment uh, i think likes of lithium are also very interesting simply because they're doing something that doesn't exist or you know exists in a very limited way in other other you know other markets so i think uh, there's a lot of learning coming out of india in that sense um on the point about ai i i mean i just feel it's almost it's it's a term that's kind of brandied around a little bit uh it's it's almost like a dirty word uh i i just feel i would just go with the definition of the way anil kind of laid it out you know whatever decisions you're making you have to be collecting data and and i think today uh we are kind of moving towards a you know uh, an ecosystem where there is so much interconnectivity that you know it's not it's not hard to do it so so I, yeah i'll probably just leave it at that thanks turning to uh, turning back to you Shil shilpi um what what do you see looking ahead and 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 what, what do you how do you think businesses need to to adapt to to the new new normal from from where you're sitting um Yes. So um, with this pandemic, uh, the people will be uh, slightly hesitant to commute. So global mobility networks um, have to regain the trust of the co consumers. That is very important. They must um, adapt short-term goals in response to the crisis, but also develop long-term frameworks to operate in. So uh, business models and strategies for new mobility normal must be leveraged on four things. Uh, number one, digitized demand responsive shared mobility com combined with hyperlocal deliveries, um, indig indigenization of supply chains, uh, electric mobility integrated with renewable energy. Um, and uh, the fourth one is data driven decision making in cities by making the cities smarter. So businesses and government will now have the opportunity to deliver dynamic and new ways of safely moving people and goods. I'll cite one example uh, here on what Ola has done. So Ola has opened up its technology platform to governments to fight uh, the COVID-19 through Ola Connects. Uh, it, Ola Connects stand, stands for Comprehensive Navigation, Networking, Control and Tracking Solution. So this is a platform that allows government agencies to manage um, real-time war rooms for various operations at scale um, amidst the uh, ongoing COVID crisis with 100% data privacy and uh, world-class security. Uh, so in the state of Punjab, for instance, this free platform is used to provide uh, electronic passes to the farmers to enable farm to market movement to, uh, to movement of the fresh produce um, in this time of crisis. So we are looking forward to partner with uh, uh, more states and support them 
through our uh, tech platform to fight together with this uh, COVID uh, crisis. Um, also in the post COVID era, um, uh, we, we see that shared mobility will make a compelling case as people will avoid uh, discretionary spending to buy new cars. Um, therefore, hygiene and safety will be prioritized in the short and long term and dependence on micro mobility, ride hailing, public transit, uh, multimodal and digitized services and deliveries will definitely grow. And, uh, and this will be further uh, strengthened by uh, public and private partnerships. So both shared mobility and hyper-local economy will, will have the potential to unlock millions of livelihood opportunities, thereby creating a pathway for economic recovery and growth. Thanks, Shopi. Actually, what I want to do before we go to the Q&A and we have one or two questions is turn to Alban, because we talked about how do you take the first step, who should take the first step and who pays? Alban joins us today, both as co-moderator, but with an announcement about who can pay and what they pay for. Alban, would you like to take uh, the, make the announcement? Yeah, I mean, hopefully we can, uh, and thanks also, Shilpi. Hopefully, hopefully we can make a, a small uh, contribution to, to, to the difficult situation that we're in now through, through this uh, upcoming coming call that I, I, I announced previously. And, and we, would, we would really like to see like, on the ground, close to market projects in, in the mobility and the smart grid space. So it could, it could, it could be, it could be uh, connected to several of the things that we have touched upon here, but also it could be connected to storage and integration of renewables or distribution grid management. So it's a little bit broader than what we're discussing here. But I think all of these questions are connected as we have heard today as well. So, so we would welcome like holistic projects, but concrete projects. Um, and we would like to see demonstration in operational, uh, in an operational environment of, of like services, products, systems, and business models. So if you're familiar with the technology's readiness level scale, we, we are pretty high up on that one. Um, so, so I ask you to stay tuned for more information. Uh, it's good to start forming up already now to, to, to find your partners and, and both on the Swedish and on the Indian side and start the discussion, organize webinars and, and get into to the details because that will give you an edge when, when the call opens very soon. Um, so having said that, I think we should turn over to the, the Q&A section and we have, we have received as far as I, I can see one question, um, but now I really urge everyone online to take the opportunity to ask questions either to, to me or Arti or, or to our extinguished uh, uh, panelists here. Um, so so I, will, I will dive into the first question actually, and um, it is from, from uh, Dipyoti from Munich, and he, he works as a venture partner for Robert Bosch, and his question is, uh, we see a lot of ride sharing services are working with grocery retailers for helping people under limited mobility. Do you see this as a long-lasting trend of, of just, or just a local um, effect or a, 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 a limited uh, trend, if you will? Yeah. Charlotte. Um, it's definitely here to stay and to be developed uh, because um, um, nothing will have a purpose if it's only a, a one-purpose solution. So if a car or a vehicle is moving in a city, it should bring with it food and people and energy or something else. So combining services, uh, but delivering home will definitely be a part of the future. And in Sweden, we have it already and we had it before. Um, yeah. Um, if I may, just very quickly, Albin, and I saw Anil raise your hand, but uh, uh, I'll take that, but very quickly, um, also on the side of uh, integrating services, I know for a fact that uh, there's some uh, mobility providers who are also using the opportunity of working with um, grocery retailers, not just for distribution, but also for charging when you actually have swappable batteries. So then it actually becomes a very nice distributed uh, charging network in addition to just having, so that, that just becomes another uh, way to kind of loop them in. So I definitely also feel that it's, uh, it's potentially a long-term trend. Excellent. Would you, like, would you like to pick up as well? 
you have to turn on your microphone. Yeah, yeah. So actually, we've been some time. Uh, uh, so you know the the malls or the hypermarkets they have grocery stores and pretty large formats. There's a big bazaar in uh, both the malls we work in. So what we do is we break it up. Is uh, you know we know when there's going to be a large commuter base coming from the malls is generally late evening. And then, you know, there are office complexes behind the malls and that's generally in the morning. So we have a tie up with this grocery store. And uh, what we tell them is, okay, between, um, you know, the in the afternoons when, you know, we don't have much uh, uh, traffic, we do grocery deliveries for them in uh, the gated communities around the area. And uh, in fact, we hit a very good B2B model where they pay us a fixed monthly fee and we give them three hours a day in the afternoon. So I think this is this is another model which is really going to uh, pick up, you know, multi-distribution points, commuters, grocery. Uh, but we also are introducing a small cargo version of the ZD. It's very nice and we've actually customizing it for a very large retailer in India who wants to uh, you know, operate around 2,000 vehicles. So we see, uh, uh, you know, we see most of the large um, uh, retailers, especially in the online segment, they're also going into uh, micro warehousing. So they don't uh, make the deliveries from a large warehouse, but they have small ware community mm -hmm. warehouses. And uh, we think that's, uh, you know, that's a, a huge opportunity for us. Because, uh, you know, if you deliver with an app and good tracking uh, in about seven to eight kilometers around the, the micro warehouses, um, uh, going forward, that's really going to uh, be a big opportunity for us in India. Charlotte, go ahead. Yeah very quickly i think that we will see a big difference between what is nice to do and what is needed to do so uh, what we learned uh, through this corona crisis is that it's absolutely possible not to fly for business meetings and not to drive to meet up with business, uh, uh, people to have meetings uh, and it's definitely not necessary to to drive and buy your food if you don't find it nice to do that. So need and nice will be uh, words that we will work a lot with going forward. Uh, and in order, and this is important to say that uh, home delivery uh, is not necessarily good for the environment uh, if if it's not uh, optimized and synchronized. So uh, again, back to what Baskar uh, was talking about also before is that we need to use the AI technology in order to route and optimize uh, those flows. Thanks very much. We've got an, a second question now for Shilpi. Uh, Shilpi, the question is, can you explain more about the emergency services that Ola is providing, specifically in Punjab? Yeah, so Ola emergency service is not specific to Punjab, but it is uh, spread across 15 cities in India. Uh, here we are providing uh, reliable and safe transport services at a nominal fee for all non-COVID related medical trips, uh, such as uh, dialysis, chemotherapy, or any other kind of medical emergency. So uh, Ola is bringing this service in partnership with various state governments and is ensuring all norms of social distancing and safety measures uh, during this, uh, under this category. So uh, citizens across uh, these, uh, the 15 cities where we have opened this category can book a cab uh, by selecting the Ola emergency category, uh, which is now there, uh, which is now in the apps uh, of those customers, and they can enter the drop lo location from the list of uh, the available hospitals in the city. So, uh, uh, currently, we have partnered with around thousand hospitals all over India for this Ola emergency category. Thanks so much. I think this concept of trust and community is going to be a strong. Uh, post-COVID factor and has come up so inspirationally during this period as well, the different ways people are actually taking non-profit actions that will serve them well in the future. We will now actually close exactly on time. We've taken 10 more minutes than required and say to everyone, both in the panel and the audience, please check in www.sibc.se and you will now have a poll to tell us if you want to do this more often. And we'd like you to say yes, of course, but let us know. We will be hosting these webinars every week 
um, a window into the India-Sweden corridor. Mobility is one of the key areas under smart cities that we work with. Tune in again and thank you again to panelists and the audience for being with us today. And you'll see on the chat window, the Q&A, the report that SIBC did together with the Smart Grid Forum and CII that was putting forward speculations and opportunities that we hope will still stand true today in a world that is hit by COVID, but still has ambition to go forward in a decarbonized transport manner. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. everyone. Thank you. Bye guys. Thank <laughs> you.